scriptures down in my notes, so I should be okay. And what I don't have, we can read on the. Um, yeah, I'm looking. I'm saying, where, where's all? Where's my Bible? <laughs> But um, one day I locked myself out of the house doing that too. I uh, was going to a shower and I had gifts and I had food and I closed the door. Lo and behold, my keys are in the house. So uh, Rebecca is going to come and read Colossians chapter 3, uh, verses 1 through 17. Amen. And today is Rebecca's birthday. <laughs> Happy birthday. <laughs> you said three, three, one to 17? Yeah. Okay. I have a cough drop in my mouth. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Um, Colossians 3. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For you are, are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanliness, inordinate affection, evil concupience. concupiscence. Yes and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which you also walked some time when you lived in them. But now you also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds." And have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge, after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do you. And above all these things put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Amen. Amen. No, it's okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for praying for Pastor. Um, he had, he has what Jeanette has, but he's getting better because he went to the doctors and the doctor gave him antibiotics and um, cough medicine, but he's uh, very weak. And I thank God for the Holy Spirit because yesterday when I'm driving home from work, I, I always call him, tell him I'm heading home, and he said, oh, I'm so weak. I'm not going to be able to do Bible study tomorrow night. So I was, okay, you know, because already the night before, God had put the book of Colossians on my heart. I hadn't done any studying or anything, but my mind was on the book of Colossians and what was going on there. So I thank God for the Holy Spirit. Father, I ask, Lord, that you hide me behind your cross, and Father, that the words that you would have to be said would be the only words, Father, that I would share today. Take everything that is of me and crash it to the ground, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I just wanted Rebecca to read Colossians uh, 3, 1 through 17, so you kind of know 
where we're at. And the title of my little Bible study here, I, I, I wrote it, I had time to write it, but I didn't have time to critique it, so um, I hope everything's okay. God knows. Okay, so Colossians 3, 1 through 17, how to win the war against sin. Amen? Amen. If you are a Christian, you know that we are constantly at war. When we come into this world, we were born into a sinful, fleshly body, right? A body controlled by the world, the devil, and its own lust. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3 says, And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sin. In other words, he made us alive. He quickened us. He made us alive. Wherein in times past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among who also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath as others. We are saved by his grace, but we were once the children of wrath, as all of those that don't know Christ today. And in the Message Bible, I, I thought it said it so much better, made it more simple for me to understand. It wasn't so long ago that you were marred in the old, stagnant life of sin. You let the world, which doesn't know the first thing about living, tell you how to live. And that's so true. You know, we follow the ways of the world, and they're, they're corrupt. We filled our lungs with polluted unbelief and then exhaled disobedience. We did, we all did it, all of us doing what we felt like doing. When we felt like doing it, all of us in the same boat. It's a wonder God didn't lose his temper and do away with the whole lot of us. Instead, immersed in mercy and with incredible love, he embraced us. He took our sin, dead lives, and made us alive in Christ. Amen? He did all this on his own with no help from us. Then he picked us up and set us down in highest heaven in company with Jesus, our Messiah. Amen. Hallelujah. And James also 1.14 says, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and then enticed. But then, one day, we came to Jesus for salvation. Do you remember the glory of that moment? I certainly do. And I know everybody does. No one forgets that day. The joy of that incredible feeling that we felt that all the old sinful ways were forever gone. Remember, we just felt like so light. We weren't, had no burden anymore. We weren't like pressed down. It felt like the world was brand new. It felt so good, and oh, how our hearts rejoiced. Amen? It wasn't long, however, until it began to dawn on us that the old nature was still alive. Oh, yes, the devil makes sure of that. He was angry. Perhaps you found yourself being drawn back to some of your old ways. You found that now there was a spiritual struggle going on inside of you. And Galatians 5.17 speaks of it. For the flesh lusted after the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And those are contrary, the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that you would do. It was at that moment that we realized that life was going to be a struggle. It is this struggle which Paul is writing about in Colossians. In these verses, though, he gives us some ammunition to fight that battle. Amen? The word of God is our ammunition to fight the devil. He lays out some principles that, if followed, 
will help us live the right kind of life before God and before the world. Because our lifestyle will speak the gospel to the unsaved. Paul is telling us how to gain the victory over the old man. What are some of the ways that your life has changed since you've been saved? Anybody? How, have you, how has your life changed since you've been saved? Rebecca? Right, the recklessness is not there anymore. Alicia, did you say something? Right, amen. You desire things towards God, amen. So we should have heavenly desires. Our affections should be set on heavenly things, things that will glorify God. 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, Whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whether so ever ye do all to the glory of God. That's our purpose, to do things in life all for the glory of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Not for our gain, but for God's glory. We are to be motivated by the heavenly and not by the earthly. We need to remember that because sometimes we forget. I was thinking about a compass, how it always points north. And um, that's the way we should be. We should be like a compass. We should always be drawn to heavenly things and not drawn away by the pull of worldly things. Amen? Amen. Ask yourself sometime when you are alone what motivates your life. Are you drawn more toward the pull of the world or toward the things of God? God's word says for us to examine ourselves, and we need to do that. Because sometimes we run amok, you know. We're not paying attention, and we're just whatever we're doing. The devil has ways to um, get us off track. Another way that our lives have been changed since we have been saved is we have received heavenly deliverance. When we came to Jesus for salvation, we died. Our old man died. Romans 6.6 6 says, Knowing this, that the old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin any longer. We're still in our earthly bodies, but we no longer have to serve sin. The old man of sin, our old nature, died at Calvary. Therefore, we have been liberated from sin and are no longer slaves to sin, Romans 6, 7. For he that is dead is freed from sin. The old nature at times seems very much alive. Sometimes it does. And it is if we give it rights to be alive. We have to be careful not to give it any footage to be alive in our life. We need to do what Romans 6.11 says. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. I know that we have to live in our fallen nature every day, but Jesus Christ has given us victory over that old nature at Calvary. He has, and we need to claim it. We are to battle it and not give in to it. James 1, 14 through 15 says, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away by his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. You know, years and years ago, I stopped looking at the circulars in the Sunday paper. I mean, I don't even remember how many years ago it was. Because I found out that I only wanted something and said I needed it when I looked in the circular. I didn't know anything about it before, but then the devil puts it in front of my face 
And I tell Bob, Bob, we should get this. We need this. <laughs> and it was so not true. But praise God, the day is coming when the old man will both be reckoned dead and literally dead. We will have great transformation. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 54 says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trump shall sound, and the dead shall be raised, incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortality put on, mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. <laughs> hallelujah! Woo! Hallelujah! Hallelujah! This corruption, this corruption that was born in a fallen nature, someday, someday in the twinkling of an eye, we will be as he is standing before him. Amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Another way that our lives have been changed since we have been saved is we have heavenly destiny. Ephesians 2.6 says, And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We are eternally saved in possessing eternal life. That is our possession. That is a promise that God has given us. Amen. Hallelujah. One day soon we will be with him in glory. Who knows how soon? Maybe tonight. Maybe in the blink of an eye at this moment. Who knows? We don't know. At that day we will be like him. 1 John 3, 1 and 2. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not, but it knew him not. Beloved, now we are the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Thank God that we belong to him and that we are heaven-bound and we are connected to him even though we are here on earth because we have his Holy Spirit living in us. Romans 8.30 says, Moreover, whom he did predestine them, he also called. And whom he called them, he also justified. And whom he justified them, he also glorified. We will one day be glorified with him. These truths alone ought to be enough to make any child of God live for Christ. In 1 John 3, 3, it says, And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Okay, so since we have gotten saved, we have a lot of promises to hold on to. But there are also challenges in this life. As the title of my little message was, Winning the War Over Sin. Romans 8.13 says, For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if you, through the Spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Mortify, to kill. I think that word comes from mortuary to mortify the deeds of the flesh, kill those deeds. We have authority over them. God has given us authority over them, and we have the Holy Spirit to help us. God wants us to mortify the flesh, put it to death, and guess who wants to do the surgery? Who's going to do the surgery to mortify the deeds of the flesh? Us. Us. God has elected us to do that killing by the help of the Holy Spirit. We're in charge. We need to take authority over those things in our lives that we need to crush and to mortify. And thank God we have the Holy Spirit to help us through. There is a lot of challenge to our human nature. Paul names the activities that need to be put to death, as Rebecca had read. The sensual sins, appealing to the senses, 
the sins of pleasure. Fornication, sexual impurity of any kind, uncleanness, a life of impurity fueled by improper motives, inordinate affection, depraved passions, a mind that dwells on sin, evil con yeah, I can say this word in my head, but try to get it out of my mouth, evil concupiscence. I know that's not how you say it because it sounds different in my head. Strong sexual desire, covetousness, the sin of always wanting more. It's a sin of idolatry. Social sins related to our dealings with others. We often try to rationalize and justify ourselves in these sins, but they are still wicked and defiling. You know how we interact with people at work and any social place, anger, sudden outburst. We need to give our anger to Jesus. Wrath refers to God's judgment on sin. This is the sin of playing God and passing judgment on others. You know, so many times you say, oh, why does this person do this? Like, why didn't they do that? No, you're not God. God is to judge the person that's unsaved, and only him. That's his place. Malice, ill will towards others, includes a desire to injure or to get revenge. I'm you, there are some really hateful people out there, and all they want is revenge and a desire to hurt other people. Blasphemy, speech which slanders another, Either God or man, most common form is gossip. When you attack God's greatest work, man, we are his greatest work, you are in essence attacking God himself. These are things that we don't think about. You know, we just, that sinful nature sometimes just rises up and we don't really think what we're doing. Filthy communications, foul speech, curse, Humor, obscene gestures. You know, sometimes you're at work and, and people are doing that, you know. When I used to eat in the lunchroom and people were doing that, I just, I get up, I go back to my desk, you know. It's terrible. Lying. No liar shall enter the kingdom of God. Anything less than the absolute truth. When we lie, we have joined hands with the devil. John eight forty four says, Ye are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So when the devil comes and he's whispering in your ear, you know, just stop glorifying God. Like when things come at me, I, I just stop praising God. I start singing, and then before you know it, whatever that was is totally gone because I'm giving God the glory. Since we have been saved, we have a challenge to be new. The Christian is called to put off, literally cast away from oneself the characteristics of oneself. We are to do this by whatever means necessary. Can someone put up Matthew 5, 29 through 30? I can't see that far. Let me see if I can see this one. Oh, I can see this. Okay. Matthew 5, 29 through 30. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And um, I know when my brother had been away from the Lord for like 25 years, I was always afraid to pray this prayer, God, whatever it takes, because I didn't know. 
<laughs> what it was going to take, and I was frightened, and I never prayed it. And then one day I said, God, whatever it takes, and he went through it. Believe me, he's even deaf in one ear because of what he went through. And um, But you know what? It's better to enter the kingdom of God like that than not to enter at all. Since we have been saved, we need to have the characteristics of a new life characterized by new deeds. Ephesians um, 24, 22, Ephesians 4, 22 through 23. That ye put off concerning the former conversation the old, of the old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful lust, and be renewed in your spirit and in your mind. That's where we need to get the fruit of the spirit. The new life, energized and led by God, will always manifest the proof of the spirit's presence. Galatians 5, 22 and 25, which everybody knows, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with affections and lust. It's not easy to crucify the flesh. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Amen? Amen. Then, the forgiveness of, of the saints. When Christ reigns in the heart, there will be no room for grudges or grievances, but only for forgiveness. You know, we're not to have ought one against each other. God does not want that. Can someone put up Matthew 18, 21 through 22? That's Matthew 18, 21 through 22. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him till seven times? Jesus said unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. So in other words, never ending. The love of the Savior. When we are walking in the newness of life, we have the love of Christ in our lives. John 13, 35, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if you have love one towards another. And that is so true. The life controlled by the Lord is a life of love. The fullness of our spiritual life since we've been saved. 2 Corinthians 13, 5, as I had said earlier, examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith, Prove your own selves, know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobates. And I wrote that down in the Message Bible, and it says, test yourselves to make sure you are solid in the faith. Amen? Amen. Don't drift along taking everything for granted. That's a big one, you know, people come to, oh, I go to church, I go Wednesday, I go Sunday, but they're just drifting along. Give yourselves regular checkups. You need firsthand evidence, not a mere hearsay that Jesus is in you. Test it out. If you fail the test, do something about it. Amen? 2 Peter 1.10, Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fail. So we need to do our due diligence. Amen? And I only have one more page left. This is going to be an early night, although I do have other messages. <laughs> no, I'll have mercy. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so that was Second Peter 1.10. You shall never fail. Since we have been saved, we are characterized by a new direction. We're going in a new direction, amen? We did a 360-degree turn. 
It is no more the flesh, the world, and the devil for the believer. Now it is the will and the word of God. Amen? Since we have been saved, we have a new dependence upon the word of God. And there are unsafe people that read the word of God, but it's just, it's not a relationship with God. It's just a historical book to them. Colossians 3.16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching, admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And I just, I just love that, being with God's people and just singing and speaking of him. It's so edifying, and sometimes we have questions and in that atmosphere, we start asking those questions that we might not ask at any other time because it's, you know, a comfortable situation and you just tend to let down your God and be who you are and, and start asking questions. I, when I first came to the Lord, I, I learned so much by doing that, always spending time with other believers and they were all older in the Lord than me, and I had so, so many questions. And, and we used to have, you know, coffee and pastry, and it was so nice, and we'd sing, and, and we'd talk about the Word of God, and, and I was blessed to be so educated. And um, since we have been saved, we are known by our new decisions. No longer are we interested in pleasing the flesh, but every decision is based on whether or not it brings glory to the Lord. Such is the life controlled by the new man. You know, sometimes you want to do something and, and you stop and you say, God, is this me? Is this going to be glor bring glory to you? Or is this just something that I want to do, that I want to be seen for, and, um, you know, I talk to the Holy Spirit all the time because um, I'm always, like, so concerned, like, is this me, you know, I'm always asking the Holy Spirit, give me a sign, I'm like Gideon, you know, like, I put up, putting out a fleece, and um, because I, I don't want to bring shame on the God that I serve. So in conclusion, is the old man dead in your life? If not, it will show up on you. Believers, you know, there are a lot of people that come to church. But God says we shall know them by their fruit. If that life, the old man's life, is not dead, those of us that are living the fruitful life as God has asked us, we'll, it, it will show up. We, we will see it because we have spiritual discernment. We will see it on those. And it's our job to love them and explain to them why they should not be maybe doing this particular thing that they're doing. We are to go to them with love. There was an, uh, I read this, and I had forgot about it because I had heard about it before. There was an ancient Roman custom of forcing a murderer to wear the corpse of his victim. Yeah. Death ate into him and drained him of life. And so it is with us if we don't continue on the road that God has called us to. You know, first comes temptation and then comes death. Who controls our life? The flesh, the world, the devil, or is it the spirit of God? If the wrong one is in control, and I thought about Rebecca when I was writing this because she had put something on Facebook. If the wrong one, she's an inspiration to me. I see a lot of her stuff. <laughs> And uh, really speaks to me, honey. Thank you. 
If the wrong one is in control, your life will be out of control and less than pleasing to the Lord. But praise his name, he allows us for new beginnings. God is the God of second chances. And he has grace and mercy upon us so many times. If we knew how many times we actually failed God, you know, there's those times where we know that we failed God because we just blatantly did something we shouldn't have been doing. That's why when we pray, we pray, God, forgive me of those sins of omission and commission, uh, sins that I know I did and sins unknowingly that I may have committed against you. And I thank him that he's merciful and that he always shows his love towards us. And um, just, you know, read Colossians chapter 3, 1 through 17, and um, hopefully this has been a blessing to you tonight. Amen. Thank you, Facebook. <laughs>